Good evening and welcome to Business Focus. This is your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. We're streaming live on Facebook. We're also live on your DSTV channel 279. Now, the world braces for clo a very close U.S. election with far-reaching consequences. The outcome of the U.S. presidential election is expected to have significant implications for global trade and tariffs affecting countries like Ghana. We'll be exploring the possible implications of the outcome of the U.S. elections on trade policies, global partnerships, tariff structures, and the overall economic landscape. Also tonight... Despite facing challenges due to constantly changing policies, Ghana's mining industry has witnessed significant positive developments. The sector's growth and stability are crucial for the nation's economy. We'll be speaking to a mining executive about the industry. Details of all these and many more coming up in the next 60 minutes. Let's start off first of all by giving you an update of how the commodities market is looking like today. And if you're a businessman or woman, you should be interested in how the CD is faring against its major trading currencies. Welcome back to Business Focus. This is your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. We're streaming live on Facebook. We're also live on your DSTV channel 279. Call a friend to call a friend to tune in to TV3 because we've got the very latest updates on the Ghanaian economy. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, the outcome of the United States presidential election uh, will have very far-reaching consequences for global trade economic stability and regional relationships affecting countries like Ghana. Now joining us is a correspondent in the United States of America, Sunny Abdurrahman. Uh, he has been working with us uh, over the past few years. Sunny, it's good to have your news uh, on Business Focus. Sunny, how are you doing tonight? Well, obviously, we're trying to bring to our audience the very best from the U.S. election. Right, so... We know voting has started in the United States. Uh, millions of people are expected to turn up to cast their ballots in this very heated race between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. But for our purposes tonight, um, I will, even before we delve into the issue of I mean, the ramifications and what it means for trade, for Africa, and particularly for Ghana, tell me what has it been like since voting started today? Well, the enthusiasm among voters has been quite high, coming out in their numbers to cast their ballots. Of course, if you look at the dominant issues in this election, uh, everybody would want to have a say as to who becomes the next president of the United uh, States. You know, the issue of uh, immigration, which has become dominant, particularly from where I'm reporting now, uh, in the Bronx, where we have a chunk of uh, immigrants living in this community. So uh, the issue of immigration is very important to them. Donald Trump has uh, promised to carry out the largest uh, deportation in the American history. Of course, this community would want to have a say as to whether to allow him to become a president and carry out his plan or stop him from getting to the White House because, of course, we know uh, the Democrats... So sorry, Sonny, I've, I've got to bat in here. Uh, I'm afraid we're having difficulties seeing you. I don't know if it's got to do with your camera, but just kindly try and reposition yourself. We need to see you. Okay. Well, I was trying to indicate to you clearly what has been happening.
Well, uh, we are having some difficulties there re-establishing contact with uh, our reporter on the ground, uh, Sani Abdul Rahman. Uh, we're just trying to gauge the um, possible ramifications of the outcome of the U.S. elections and its impact on trade in Africa and particularly in Ghana. Uh, and so Sani is helping us do that analysis. I'm told he's back on the on the Zoom. Sani, uh, if you can hear me, uh, just continue with the point you're making. Well, Fagos, I'm trying to fix the camera, but uh, essentially what I'm saying is that the election has been uh, a lot of voters here are quite upbeat, wanting to have a say in who becomes the president of the United States. Uh, looking at the issues, especially from where I'm reporting, as I indicated, I'm reporting from the Bronx community, a chunk of residents in this community are immigrants. They have families who may have come into this country uh, and haven't gotten the chance to regularize themselves. So they would want to see a president that would give their relatives the chance to do so, and not a president that will carry out mass deportation, as Donald Trump has promised. Sonny, beyond immigration, there's an issue of trade uh, in Africa. We saw what Donald Trump did then as president. We've seen what Biden is doing as president and Kamala as, as vice president. Now, we know that one commonality among the two has been the AGWA, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, which expires sometime next year. Uh, it is expected that both uh, either Trump or Kamala Harris will renew that. But how important is AGWA to Africa? Well, quite important because it has opened the markets for African entrepreneurs to get their products uh, to the United States. Of course, a big economy and the consumption quite high. And this has created opportunities for many young Africans who are able to also employ their colleagues and their friends and their families in the small businesses that they have. But we know with Donald Trump, he is a win-win person. If he opens the U.S. market for you, what are you bringing to the table in return? And with what benefit will that opportunity be to the United States? So that's a conversation that is uh, quite concerning to entrepreneurs, not just from Africa, from around the world, who are accessing the U.S. market. They will want to see what Donald Trump will do regarding that, whether he's going to close the market. He has promised to uh, roll out a lot of tariffs. Will that uh, affect their businesses? Or you will give them the chance continue operating and sending their goods here to sell as we have been seeing under the Agua arrangement. So now, there are those who fear that geopolitical tensions are likely to rise with a Donald Trump presidency. We saw what he did as president with all the sanctions imposed on China. Um, is this a fear that is grounded on any certainty or fact? Well, I think Donald Trump has not shied away from expressing what he will be doing when he gets to the Oval Office. And don't forget that is, this is his second term. If he's given the chance, he will have nothing to lose. He will want to carry out a lot of things that he didn't do or he didn't get to do uh, in his first term because he will want the mandate to be given to him again. But certainly Donald Trump has indicated he will do these things that you have outlined, he hasn't shied away from it. If you go to his campaign rallies, you find a lot of placards with inscriptions uh, promoting that ideology. So essentially, if he get, gets the opportunity to get to the White House, I think this will be part of the things he'll be executing in his early days in office. And what will be the place for Africa, or if you like Ghana, in all these geopolitical um, tensions? We know that China is the largest, uh, Africa's largest trade partner. And we've seen how China has dealt with African countries, the, the major investments in, in telecommunications and infrastructure. Now, if, if these geopolitical tensions get heightened because of a Trump presidency who likes to you know, deal with countries on a more bilateral level, um, uh, what, will, what, would it, what would African countries have to do to respond to this? Do they necessarily have to take a stance in all these tensions between China and America, or, or they just have to adopt a, you know, a neutral stance? Well, secondly, publicly, uh, Ghana cannot live in isolation and the rest of it, African counterpart. But the big also issue is that uh, if you look at these challenges, it's... it's great opportunities for 
African countries to also become innovative. We are seeing the emergence of BRICS and the campaign that is going around to get countries to align to BRICS that is creating another market. We are seeing efforts to reduce the dominance of the U.S. dollar, which, if it happens, will create opportunity for these markets. We are seeing efforts, or we've seen efforts in the last couple of months by Kamala Harris coming to Ghana, going to some African countries, trying to rally support and ensure that America does not lose its relevance on the global scale. America does not lose its leadership on the global scale. So if America decides with a new president to chart a new path from what we are seeing in the global trade order, that may be quite challenging in the initial stage, but certainly will create opportunity for countries like Ghana to explore other avenues to build their economies. Uh, finally, Sonia, and if you could make this very brief for me, there's also those, there are also those who are hopeful that with the Kamala Harris presidency, we're going to see a lot more investment into green energy uh, because also um, critical minerals is an essential commodity for whoever becomes the next American president. And so African countries or Ghana, you know, for that matter, are likely to benefit a lot more in terms of investment in green energy and also, you know, having a lot more American companies, you know, come into the continent and invest in, especially in, this, in the infrastructure to access these mineral resources. Well, Pagos, if you look at the two energy policies of these parties, I'm referring to the Democrats and the Republicans. Donald Trump, we know, was the president who uh, kind of cancelled or pulled America away from the 2015 Paris Act. That's an indication that he believes in fossil fuel. He has made it clear that he will roll out a lot of tariffs, which may take some businesses away from America. But he is hopeful that he will use fossil fuels, he will dig more oil and get more oil, and that will cover for the losses that America, America may have as a result of a splashing tariff that may take certain businesses away. So clearly, if Kamala Harris comes into office, there will be more investment in green energy, and that means more resources for producing nations. And if Donald Trump comes, there will be more investment in fossil fuel, and that means green energy may have less attention. Thank you, Sunny Abdul Rahman. I'm sure uh, you can work on your cameras and hopefully uh, or in subsequent uh, bulletins would have you uh, more on this uh, American elections and, and what the outcome uh, portends for all of us. Thank you, uh, Sunny Abdul Rahman, uh, for your time tonight on Business Focus. We're going to go for a quick break. When we return, I'll introduce my guest to you. Right, welcome back to Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. Now, my guest for the next segment is the Chief Executive Officer and founder of Nguvu Mining and Adamos Resources. Uh, she's one of the very few women in the mining industry and controls mining concessions in three other African countries. She employs about 3,000 workers. My guest tonight is Angela List. Angela, it's good to have you on the program. Good evening. Good evening, Takasi. How are you? I am very well, thank you. So, woman in mining, how's mining? It's challenging, but um, still exciting times mm. in the industry. Yes. Mm. So, you're Chief Executive Officer of Nguvu Mining. Is that so? That's correct. Okay. And uh, you've been mining for how many years now? Well, mining has been um, since 2017, um, but prior to that, since 2001, I've been in the mining contracting business. So you could say um, I've been in mining for 23 years now, um, initially in mine services, um, but I set up the mining, actual mining business in 2017 with, with the acquisition of of our first mine in Ghana, which was Adamus Resources. Mm. Women in mining, I mean, why would you first of all want to go into mining? Mm. It, was, it was not planned at all. I, um, I just got thrown into it um, by default. Um, I was, after I graduated from school, I joined KPMG um, in audit and my husband, um, who was into mining services, you know, had a business um, in Ghana that 
got into difficulties and and so I was asked to to come and help and, and that was really my introduction into into mine and I, I thought I was going to do it for six months so I took unpaid leave for six months and technically I'm still on unpaid leave. I never went back. So this is in 2001 and that's when you had your first stint with mining and you've done this for over 21 years and then you decided to set up your own mining company in 2017 with a start of in Guvu. Yes and, and that, that is also another interesting story. I was um, with a, with a friend in, in London um, who was then the CEO of Endeavour Mining um, and just over coffee he asked me how I would like to own a mine in Ghana. You know, I thought it was a joke. Um, the next thing I knew um, we were back at, at their offices um, negotiating the, the acquisition and, and thankfully I was able to raise money from you know, one of the banks um, to make that that first acquisition. A year later, I guess this one went so well, he, um, he told me they had another mine in, in Mali for sale. In Mali? Yes. So um, the very next year we, um, we acquired the second mine from Endeavour Mining and, and a year after that was, was Niger, which was um, an agreement directly with the government of Niger to re restart an old mine and, and revamp it. So, how many countries do you work in? I'm currently operating in three countries, and producing in, in those three countries. And, and you mine what? Gold? Gold, yeah. And in total, you've got how many workers? In excess of 3,000. In excess of 3,000 workers. Uh, are these direct workers at the mines? Yes. Wow, that must be very bold and audacious. I saw a clip of you um, about a month ago uh, where you were, I think, commissioning some new mining equipment. Was it in February this year? Yes. That's, um, that's a model of it on the table. Liber? Liber, okay. yes. It's um, the first of its kind in, in Africa. They're um, a hybrid, so they can run completely electric and basically fits in with a ESG goals of you know, being environmentally friendly. Um, so we, we have 13 of those trucks um, carry about 100 tonne of material. And these machines are operating in all of your mines across Africa? In Ghana currently, in Ghana. yes. Okay. So which regions do you operate in? In the western region. Um, we also have um, a mine that we're currently building a plant for in, in Konongo. That would be the fourth operating mine. Um, we hope to, um, to get that up and running soon. But, you know, mining must be very capital intensive. I mean, come to talk of the equipment used in mining, even, you know, managing a mine itself must be very capital intensive. How do you manage all this? No, it's, um, it's definitely the most challenging part um, of the business and, and being privately owned, it's um, a lot more difficult to, to raise the, the needed capital. Um, but we've managed you know, to, um, to get by. We have the support of quite a few banks um, here in Ghana who we work very, very well with. And so we've been fortunate in, in that regard. Mm. This has been largely male dominated. You've got other mining uh, firms managed by your male compatriots. Uh, how challenging is it as a woman, you know, navigating this field of mining? Mm -hmm. No, it's, um, it can be quite overwhelming actually. And um, I guess, for me, I, I just don't have a choice but to keep forging ahead um, because it's a huge responsibility to have, you know, um, to support businesses with, you know, over 3,000 people that, that rely on, on you to keep going. Um, I sometimes feel as, as though I'm not welcome in the space, you know, almost. Um, as people are just intrigued, I, I guess there aren't enough women doing this and, and I, I pray and hope every day that there would be more women that would make this, um, this bold step, you know. Thankfully, 
um, in industry you see a lot of changes. The industry has been very intentional about bringing women on board. Um, but back to your question, I mean, the, the challenge is, is that you know you you're almost um, underestimated every time by your men counterparts, and you know um, some can be pretty vile. Mm. Um, Have you at any point in time just decided to call it quit? Oh yes, all the time, and you know my mum is my shrink, <laughs> so. Um, when I'm down, um, that's where I go, and you know she she gives me the um, the pep talk, mm. and yeah, I, I mean I I've been told by some you know what are you doing in this industry? You should be modelling on the catwalk. You, know? <laughs> you can't match me boot for boot. Wow. Some have been quite by your male compatriots. In, indeed, and and yes. Um, it is tough, and, and especially when you, you consider the fact that you, um, we operate in other cultures in the region as well, some that don't really um, have too many women working you know, by virtue of the religion or, or what have you. And yes, um, you have to, to show up and, and do what you have to do. Yeah. I know you're Ghanaian. Um, many won't believe it because of your color, but you're full blooded Ghanaian. Um, I need to ask you about the business environment within which you've operated over the, the last few years. Of course, in 2001, you were working with someone. What, what has the business environment been like, you know, from 2001 up until now? You mean the industry? General industry, the regulator, the business environment generally, cost of credit. I think things have, have grown a lot, um, but at the same time it's become very challenging um, because policies keep changing. I think the, the positives I can see is, is in the, um, the local content um, policies that have been passed, you know, because prior to that, and, and I tell my counterparts all the time, when I first started, you know, about 20 years ago, I would always be in meetings with um, with expatriates, you know, they dominated. Um, whether it was in the chief executives, the heads, you know, was, um, and and our business itself had quite a number of expatriates. So in in that way, it's been very positive. We've evolved, you know. Now you hardly see any expatriates in meetings, um, and and then you know, Parliament passed the. Um, affirmative action um, law this year um, and so people are forced to make those changes and I, I say that you know that's um, that's a positive at the same time you know some policies um, have have worked against the industry and, and made things a lot tougher and it would be nice if if these policy makers um, engaged with industry a bit more um, I think that we would we would um, do a lot better with with some dialogue. Are you political? Not at all. Why? I have no interest in politics, first of all. Um, and secondly, it's, um, it's a space where business people should just not play, you know, I think. Um, and, you know, I know I've been accused of, of being political, but um, the fact that I've worked through changes in governments all across the region should, should tell you that I, I am not. I, I just obey authority and I work with whoever is there. You know, we've been... I mean, if you've worked since 2001, it means you've transcended, you know, political regimes, you know, NDC, NPP. You must have friends scattered across the political landscape. Absolutely. And, and the same in, in other countries mm -hmm. um, where... where um, where I operate, and, and indeed in, in Mali and Niger, where, where I continue to work um, despite you know, the, the changes in, the in, in regime mm. to, to military. Um. So how do you build your influences as a woman? I don't think I build my influences. I just, you know, I'm a very collaborative person, naturally, and, and I, I guess it's... Um, it's a quality that has helped, you know, um, because I, I'm always looking for that win-win 
situation wherever I go and and that sincerity pays off because I'm I'm not I'm looking to take advantage and I think the people obviously welcome. So tell me about the communities within which you operate and, and the kind of influence you've you've built in those regions. I, of course I know you you provide employment to a lot of the indigents there. What else do you do as a company? We we take our engagement with our communities very seriously. Um, so you know we've um, over the years you know, always had a good relationship with our communities, um, done quite, quite a lot in, in our social, um, in our CSR. And yes, um, I particularly, I guess, because I'm a woman, um, tend to work a lot with our Queen Mothers as well. Um, and through that, we've been able to, to train quite a number of, of young women, um, you know, both in the mining operations as well as in unrelated um, businesses where you know they they are thriving at the moment mm. you've built community roads uh, sent people to school build hospitals are those part of your csr obligations they are they are, mm. they are. And we're passionate about education um, you know we in fact we recently collaborated with with one of the schools an agricultural school to to set up a fish farm um, and, and a vegetable farm as well, and, and all our produce um, comes from that school. So, you know, there are quite a number of good initiatives um, in, in, that, in that space. So I'm very passionate about education and children. Mm. What challenges confront you on a daily basis? I mean, there's a lot of talk about Galamse these days, um, and I can't help but ask you, um, as a woman who's operating within that field, how much of a challenge is, is, is Galamse or illegal mining? No, it's, um, it's taken up at least 50% of my time now. And, you know, it's, it's an absolute menace. I, I can't describe enough how, how bad it is um, because, you know, every day our security men go out and they're, they're in a battlefield. You know, we've had one shot in the eye. We've had recently with illegal miners invading invading and ready to kill yeah and 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 the kind of ammunition that they they bear is is quite astounding i mean it's um military style ammunition i mean they're in possession of explosives and and all that you know so um you know, and, and interestingly, the communities more and more seem to be advocating for um, small-scale mining, which, you know, um, is, is another added, you know, problem because they, they don't have the implements to actually carry out this work in, in most cases. And, you know, the um, environmental policies and you know the environment is is not considered in in some of these operations they're they're applying mercury to to the gold which seeps into the um, the water bodies and and the soil and and the like um, i mean there have been some good um, small scale operations around but you know where where we operate um, now it's it's actually quite quite devastating because gold is a finite resource so you know you could give them one area because they're not exploring at the same time they got that part of the land and they they keep moving you know and before you know it the the entire place is is um, is, is destroyed is it a menace you think can be tackled head-on Obviously, um, with, with the willpower, you know, the will to do that. But of course, the government indeed uh, put in a lot of efforts, you know, from 2017 to 2020, we saw a lot of efforts by the then Minister of, of, of Land and Natural Resources, uh, and we thought that it was going to be a thing of the past. Unfortunately, it seems to be rearing its ugly head again, this time causing more devastation than, than we earlier thought. Yeah, no, it's absolutely out of control. Mm. I, I couldn't say otherwise. It's, it's out of control. 
Um, there is the, the, um, the talk about doing something about it. And, and I must admit, when we um, have these head-on attacks um, from, from these illegals, we do get assistance from the security agencies, um, more so the military um, you know, than, than anyone else. Um, but there are times when you know, we arrest these, these galamseers and send them to the police and they do nothing. I mean, they, they return everything to them, they, they release them. So there isn't enough of a deterrent, unfortunately. To, um, to stop it. Does this frustrate you sometimes? Very much so, because we, we feel as though we have no rights now. Um, and especially when the, the security agencies that are supposed to protect us fail to do so. And, and in some cases, our, our employees are arrested unfairly, you know, with, with one being arrested recently and charged with armed robbery. Really? was in the line of duty yes he's still he's still in custody but they let the perpetrators go mm -hmm. but it is it is a threat to our livelihood it's a threat to our lives it's you know it's and everybody can see that but, but even for people like you how much is it costing your business having to deal with galam sayers you know constantly invading your property and even killing your people how much of a cost is this to you it's huge i mean the amount of money we spend protecting our, our concessions is, is incredible. I mean, we have almost a quarter of our workforce in security just to, just to keep the place. A quarter? Yeah. Wow. What's the best approach to dealing with this canker? In your view, have you thought about it? It's, it's very interesting, you know, because as mining companies, we're very regulated. You know, we, we have inspectors come in you know, from EPA, Mincom, and, and all of that. I think that there has to be some visible regulation of this, even if it's not some swoop from the military or whatever. But it's not obvious that, you know, these people are being discouraged from doing what they're doing. And, and that's what frustrates me. Do you face this same challenge in these other African countries that you operate, for instance, Mali, Niger? What's the environment there like? It's similar, unfortunately, very much so. And, and it's a security risk, you know, because you know, at least here in Ghana, we, we have, you know, some stability and, and, and safety. But in other countries, like in Niger, where terrorists are operating, it's a very easy way of making money. So that's the other scary part. You're still watching Business Focus. My guest is Angela Les, Chief Executive Officer of Nguvu Mining Limited. We'll be back shortly. You've been doing this since 2001 and talking of equipment, you know, more sustainable ways of mining. What has been the evolution with time? What are we seeing now different from what used to be uh, in, in 2001, for instance? So it's, it's more in the um, electric space. So, you know, with improved technology, we've seen more um, electric operated equipment. And, uh, recently, um, Lee Bear and Fortescue Minerals, um, you know, had uh, have come up with with an excavator, quite quite a huge one that's completely electric driven. Um, so those would help with emissions and and the like. That that's really the space. And you know, we're looking into solar energy to replace our diesel generators and and obviously the other more harmful sources of power. So um, most companies have um, timelines to, to achieve zero emissions, um, some as close as 2030. And, and, and you're so far satisfied with the local content provisions? I mean, it's um, work in progress. Mm. It's um, really about encouraging more more local content in the manufacturing space. Unfortunately, you know, most, 
most of the implements we use for mining are imported. Um, so I'd like to see a lot more in, in manufacturing, you know, the consumables that we, we use in mining. Mm. I'm sure there are a number of females out there who are probably watching you and see you as an inspiration and obviously wanting to enter into mining. What advice would you have for them? Not encourage them to 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 come into in this very fiesty male dominated space where sometimes you're told the most uh, unhealthy things yeah but the more of us the better right at least in my recent strategy session i had you know another female but i'm i'm tired of being outnumbered by the men sometimes i'm the only woman so i i really would encourage more women to to make that You've won a few awards lately. You won Mining Woman of the Year recently. How do these all, how do you receive these? And of course, also seeing you know, the cover page of this uh, Ivorian magazine. I don't know what's written there, but I see Angela List. Uh, what's this? <laughs> For mining sector, I'm the year, original and inclusive. For original and inclusive mining sector. You were featured on this magazine. Yeah. You must have been excited about it. I um, I should say I'm. <laughs> I prefer to keep a low profile. So mm. I mean, I I take it with all humility. I think there are a lot more women out there who ought to be celebrated. You know, but yes. Well, what inspires you? People. By people, what do you mean? My my team. You know, and. I get asked all the time what gets you up out of bed and going and it's, it's really all the people that, that rely on me to keep going. That's and these are 3,000 people? In excess of. Yeah. In excess of 3,000. 3,000 direct people? Yeah. Mm. That must put a huge drain on your finances. Absolutely. But you managed to do it and you've done it since 2017, right? They do the work, so I'm grateful for everything they do. And, mm. you know. So, I mean, what exactly do you do? So I know you mine gold. Do you sell them? Do you mine on behalf of a multinational company? What exactly do you do? So we produce and export to a refinery and all the companies have government interests. So in the case of Ghana, it's 10%, and same in Mali as well. Um, so, so the government of Ghana has 10% interest equity, equity in Nguvu? In, in, the, um, in Adamus. Adamus, okay. Because Nguvu covers you know, all the other countries. Other countries and okay. the government of Mali has 10% of Segala and so in Niger. So 10% of everything that you produce goes to the government? No, they own 10% of the equity. Of the equity, okay. So they're entitled to, to dividends in, in okay. the case of. But we also pay a royalty, which is um, a percentage of every gold production. So that's you know, paid as you, as you export. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we mine, we actually do the, the mining ourselves. We drill and blast, we haul. We process the, the ore into gold, we pour the gold and it gets exported to the refinery. And the gold content is, is sold, um, so is the silver, and we pay royalties on that. And yeah, that's essentially what it is. Interesting. So, looking ahead, um, what are your goals and vision? Um, for your company and the mining industry generally in Africa? We're looking to increase the number of ounces that we produce. Um, you know, so we're ramping up you know, and um, trying to build the advanced mines that we have in the portfolio. So that's, that's our main focus, to um, continue to explore and um, increase the, um, the resource we need to mine because that's what that's what determines the life of the business what would you re like to be remembered for i 
that's a tough one. <laughs> what would I like to be remembered for? Just being a good person. I want people to have fond memories of, of me and, and their relationship with me. That's, um, and, you know, basically uplifting, uplifting people. I want people whose lives have been touched by me to remember me. So I'll come back to what we talked about, about the industry being very much male dominated and some of the unpleasant comments you've had from other compatriots. Um, I mean, how do you survive it? With difficulty. That you have to go and bid for a contract, you know, with other male counterparts and then you win that contract and then I'm sure it comes with a lot of headache for you, doesn't it? It does. Um, you get the threats, you get the accusations, you know, um, and it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. Um, and I see that more in Ghana, unfortunately. Um, I, I don't see that um, spirit of unity amongst the Siskinans. Um, and it's, it's sad. I think things have changed over time. You know, when I was growing up, it, um, things were a lot different. And I think we've, we, we seem to have grown a, what's the word for it? Very, very, a very vile society almost, you know, um, greedy and vile. I see. You, you operate also, I know, you said Mali, Niger and Ghana as well. I mean, comparing the uh, regulatory environment, um, how are they like? So the Francophone countries are, are slightly different and interestingly, most of them want to learn from Ghana because, you know, Ghana has been doing mining for a lot longer. Um, but, you know, when I think about you know, countries like, like Cote d'Ivoire, I, I think they've, they've done quite well in, in, that, in that space, in, in the space of, of policy, because, you know, they have a state-owned company that actually does mining and exploration. And, and in some instances, they've actually started operating and then, you know, sold shares to to multinationals, um, which, which is a really good thing. And, you know, we could do a lot better in our space, developing the assets ourselves so that we can have a bigger piece of the pie, you know, as, as a country. Mm. And in, in Mali and Niger and, and Burkina, they're, they're um, advocating for more locally owned mines now. And, and in Burkina, the state, um, also has set up an entity to actually operate operate these mines. So you see them very much focused on, on local content, although they started a lot later, mm. they seem to be a lot more aggressive mm. on, on that. I see. And how do you deal with obstacles? I mean, I'm sure uh, throughout your working career as a, a mining mogul, you've not always had it rosy with the press. Um, how have you dealt with obstacles that have come your way? Come where I where I can, I I have issued three battles, um, but I I pray. That's how I I deal with it, and and a lot of the time I I don't read beyond the headlines. Um, I would let my my legal team do that because I, I found the first couple, you know, were um, quite um, devastating um, for me. I, I just couldn't understand the motive um, or the fact that they could even do that at all. You know, I'd never seen, you know, all these years no one had ever written about me and I wanted to stay that, you know, um, private person. So it was very difficult to deal with initially, and I guess more so for my children, you know, when they, they are much, much more affected, and, and that, as you can imagine, is, mm -hmm. is 
difficult for me because I have to deal with that. Mm, I know you've got to some two lovely kids. One of them plays go uh, golf. Yes, uh, your older son. Yeah. Tell me a bit about him. Yeah, so um, Daniel's um, a pro. He's a professional golfer. He, uh, he plays on the US PGA in the Con Ferry Tour and recently won the California State Championship. Oh, you must have been proud. They're very proud, mm. you know. He's, um, he's been playing in Europe as well. He, he recently qualified in a tournament in Austria to, to play in Spain, so he'll, he'll be... And I think he owns a foundation or something? Yeah, he, he set up the Danny List Foundation um, to encourage more young golfers, because when he started playing golf in Ghana, there were hardly any juniors playing. It'd be nice to see more Ghanaians on the on the world stage. Mm -hmm. So that's his passion, to. Um, and you supported him. Absolutely, full heartedly. I was I was very touched when he came up with the idea because he's been away for so long, and and so when he when he told me this was something he wanted to do, I was I was very touched by it, and I supported him wholeheartedly. Yes. All right, so as we wrap up our conversation, um, we know the Chamber of Mines is calling for a mining revenue management like the Petroleum Revenue Management Act that will manage revenues uh, accruing from the mining sector. Um, what do you make of that? Well, we already have the Minerals Income Investment Fund doing that. And um, to be honest, I've been extremely impressed with what they've done. As you know, MIF has um, invested significantly in, in gold assets, and they're a significant shareholder in Asante Gold. Um, I think so has GIF and the Songo Soul plant and, and quite a few initiatives and for the first time I see something being done you know with our, our royalties um, and they've, they've grown that fund quite significantly which is which is a good thing yeah finally do you have an interest in who wins this year's elections not at all why I don't think it's, um, it's of any importance, really, who wins. It doesn't matter for the growth of your business? No, because we're not, a, we're not a political company. We don't, we don't engage in, in government projects at all. So mining has never been a, political, a politically um, Exposed. Exposed business, to be honest. It's mostly in, in private hands. Mm -hmm. So all I, do, I hope is, is that the right person, you know, um, wins and, and keeps the economy going stronger. Angela, thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you. It's good to have you on the program. Thank you so much. All right, so that was uh, Angela List. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Nguvu Mining Limited. Uh, share with us her story and all the difficulties she's been through uh, as a mining professional. Right, that's all for Business Focus. My name is Parkus Yassari. For more on Business Focus or for more on this interview, you can go to our Facebook page. We also stream live on YouTube. You can get a copy of that on YouTube as well. Uh, we're also live on your DSTV channel 279. That's all for Business Focus. We'll return same time next week with another edition of the program.